So in chapter 13, we talked about um, the motor neurons, the lower motor neurons, which go from the um, ventral horn and spinal cord out to the neuromuscular junction. Now we're going to talk about the motor tracts, which are the upper motor neurons. Their cell bodies live in the cerebral cortex, and they go from the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord. So this is our central motor system. So for the learning objectives, um, I want you to be able to state where each of the five main types of motor tracts start and end and what type of information is transmitted in each tract. So similar to what we did with the somatosensory system, I don't necessarily need you to know every gory detail about each of the motor tracts, but just where they start and end and what type of information is transmitted. Um, the really super nice thing about the motor tracts is their names tell you exactly where they start and end. So it's going to be like corticospinal, from the cortex to the spine. Easy squeezy. Um, more symptoms, um, we're going to define fractionation, hyperreflexia, hypertonia, and hypotonia, which we already talked about a little bit. So there is some sensory contribution to movement control. So it's not just like, oh, the sensory system does its thing, and then it's processed, and then the motor system does its thing. There is a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of um, feedback. So feed forward um, refers to the anticipatory use of sensory information to prepare for movement. And there's a lot of that that goes on. And then there's feedback, which refers to the use of sensory information during or after movement to make corrections either to the ongoing movement or to future movements. So the cerebellum works a lot in the feed forward feedback business, um, trying to make sure we're doing the movements that we really intend. The central motor system consists of the brain stem and spinal cord and their interactions among the signals from somatosensory neurons and descending motor tracts to determine the output from motor neurons to muscles. So the brain stem and the spinal cord and the cerebellum um, and the cerebrum all kind of um, coordinate the, all the information in order to determine what output is going to those lower motor neurons. Um, the cerebellum and the motor part of the basal ganglia adjust activity in the descending motor tracts, and um, that results in excitation or inhibition of motor neurons. So the cerebellum and basal ganglia, which we'll talk about um, in chapters 15 and 16, they do a lot in um, adjusting the activity in muscles, even though they don't have a direct connection to those lower motor neurons but they um, adjust the activity in the descending motor tracts to control what's going on in the motor neurons without a direct connection. So the motor tracts to the spinal cord um, provide all the motor signals that go from the brain to the spinal cord. There are um, medial motor tracts which synapse with motor neurons that innervate postural and girdle muscles. There are ones that are called non-specific motor tracts that contribute to background levels of excitation in the spinal cord and facilitates local reflex arcs. So you have motor tracts that are just kind of working on that spinal reflex um, area. And then we have um, so the postural and gross movements are controlled by the medial motor tracts. A motor tract activity controlling postural and gross movement usually occurs automatically. There doesn't need to be a conscious decision made. It's just going on in the background. Because, um, you know, we're, we're not thinking about how am I standing unless you're deliberately trying to um, change your posture. And then that becomes more of a voluntary movement. Medial motor tract activity can occur before someone is even consciously aware of a stimulus. And the example given in the text is a loud noise happens behind you. The eyes and face turn toward the sound before the person is even consciously aware of that auditory stimulus. So those gross movements and postural movements can happen so fast that we're not even aware of them. So um, 
there are three tracks that are included in the um, medial, uh, medial motor tracks. The reticulospinal tract, and from its name, we can tell it goes from the reticular system to the spine. And it, the reticulospinal tract facilitates bilateral motor neuron, um, neurons innervating postural and gross limb movement of the muscles throughout the body. So the reticulospinal tract, you can think of it as like muscle alertness. Um, if you if you sort of think of the reticular system as alertness and um, attention, um, it's like keeping our muscles alert enough, if that makes sense. That's just my way of saying it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's doing that exactly, but it's sort of um, getting the postural and gross limb movements going. Um, the medial and lateral vestibulospinal tracts, and so from the name vestibulospinal, you know it goes from the vestibular system to the spine. So it receives information about head movement and head position from the vestibular apparatus in the inner ear, and the vestibular apparatus responds to gravity information. So those vestibulospinal tracts are responding to gravity information to keep us um, balance to keep our posture going. The medial corticospinal tract, and from the name corticospinal, it goes, it's a direct connection from the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord. And that is what is sending those voluntary muscle movements. Okay, so reticulospinal tract and the vestibulospinal tract are sort of involuntary happening in the background, and the corticospinal tract is voluntary going from the decision made in the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord. So fractionated movements and distal limb movements happen in the lateral motor tracts. Fractionation is the ability to activate individual muscles independently of other muscles, and it's essential for normal movement of the hands. Um, without fractionation, the fingers and thumb would act as a single unit, like they do when they, you pick up a water bottle, um, instead of being able to do things like type on your keyboard or play the piano or um, pick up an individual little thing or do some of those precision grips that we talked about in kinesiology. Um, motor tracts that descend into the lateral spinal cord and synapse with laterally located motor neuron pools in the ventral horn are in the lateral corticospinal tract. So um, the these are sort of more of the fine fractionated movements and distal limb movements. So the lateral cortical, uh, corticospinal tract fractionates movement by activating inhibitory neurons to prevent unwanted muscles from contracting. So it's not just a matter of contracting the muscles we want, but it's inhibiting the muscles we don't want. And it's um, the lateral corticospinal tract is the most important pathway controlling voluntary movements. So the medial um, um, spinal tracts are more um, postural and um, unconscious movements, or they're, they're happening without us thinking about them. The lateral corticospinal tract is is controlling voluntary movements and preventing unwanted movements. Um, the primary motor cortex is located anterior to the central sulcus in the precentral gyrus. The primary sensory cortex is just posterior to the central sulcus, so they're neighbors, the primary motor cortex and the primary sensory cortex. Just like the primary sensory cortex, which is arranged somatotropically, the primary motor cortex is as well. So there are two regions that are anterior to the primary motor cortex that are involved in preparing for movement the premotor area and the supplementary motor area. And we will talk more about these specific cortical areas in the cerebral cortex chapter. When we have um, motor tract lesions or upper motor neuron lesions, we have some different signs um, from lower motor neuron lesions. So signs of motor tract lesions include paresis and paralysis, and so that can be similar to lower motor neuron abnormal reflexes, myoplasticity, um, abnormal muscle tone, 
loss of fractionated movements, and that makes sense if we lose the lateral um, corticospinal tract, abnormal co-contraction, and abnormal muscle synergies. So paresis and paralysis with uh, motor tract lesions or upper motor neuron lesions, um, you can get hemiplegia, which is weakness affecting one side of the body. Um, paraplegia affects the body below the arms. Tetraplegia affects all four limbs. It used to be called quadriplegia. Now it's tetraplegia. Um, paresis occurs in motor tract lesions as a consequence of inadequate facilitation of motor neurons. So you get paresis with um, motor neuron lesions and also with motor tract lesions because the motor neurons are not getting the um, facilitation that they need. Paralysis occurs in muscles innervated by motor neurons below the level of a complete spinal cord lesion. So again, the motor neurons um, are not getting the um, facilitation they need from the motor tracts. So there are some cutaneous reflexes that can be abnormal with motor tract lesions. Um, Babinski's sign is the extension of the great toe, often accompanied by fanning of the other toes. So you firmly stroke the lateral sole of the foot from the heel to the ball of the foot and then across the ball of the foot. And you'll see this in babies. Babies have a Babinski sign because their um, cutaneous reflexes haven't integrated yet. But in an adult, it's always abnormal. So um, more in with a, a spinal cord injury and some other um, neurological functions, um, you can have muscle spasms in response to cutaneous stimuli. Um, spasms begin after recovery from spinal shock. So we'll talk more about spinal cord injuries in the spinal chapter, but um, initially after a spinal cord injury, you have spinal shock. And then um, uh, when they recover from that, um, you can get some muscle spasms. A lot of times what I see um, in people with SCIs, especially if they use a wheelchair for mobility, they're sitting um, in a, a trunk flexion position and hip flexion. If Once they get out of the chair and they lie flat, they get muscle spasms in their abdominals, and it takes a while for them to um, recover from those. So um, the three most common abnormal reflexes with chronic um, spinal cord injuries are muscle stretch hyperreflexia, clonus and the clasp knife response so we'll talk about those individual ones so phasic stretch hyperreflexia it's loss of inhibitory corticospinal input combined with enhanced excitability of motor neurons and interneurons you get excessive motor neuron response to afferent input from stretch receptors so excessive muscle contraction occurs when the muscle spindles are stretched as a result of excessive um, firing of the motor neurons so when you lose that cortical spinal input and you get the enhanced excitability of motor neurons, then um, the muscles respond to a stretch. So like I was saying, the person with the chronic spinal cord injury um, who uses a wheelchair for mobility, they get out of the chair. You get muscle stretch on those trunk um, flexors and you get um, muscle cramps, excessive muscle contraction. So that's that phasic stretch hyperreflexia. Tonic stretch reflex um, is usually present only in people with motor tract lesions, and it continues as long as the stretch is maintained. So the phasic stretch, um, you have um, excessive muscle contraction right away, and then it relaxes. The tonic stretch continues as long as the stretch is maintained. It doesn't relax. So you have to um, decrease the stretch in order to decrease the cramping. Um, following motor tract lesions, loss of presynaptic inhibition allows slow or sustained stretch of the central spindle to elicit a continual muscle contraction. So as long as you have stretch on that muscle spindle, you're going to have muscle contraction. 